Time is on now. Begin. You guys are starting in the first seat. Go. One of the defining features of the play are the long and complex monologues between the characters. Uh, the excerpt we have takes place after Lear disowns Cordelia and shares his kingdom between uh, his remaining daughters. Lear retires and plans to spend the rest of his time visiting his children. His, his, his first visit is Goneril. When he gets there, her staff is rude to him and her group. And when Goneril arrives, she blames this on Lear's men and dismisses half of them. Outraged, Lear responds by insulting Goneril and ranting before leaving to see Reagan, hoping that she still loves him. We will be now analyzing Lear's insults towards Goneril and how he conveys his message. From Lear's response, we can see two main ideas. First, there, uh, he directly insults Goneril and tries to place a curse on her. Second, he realizes that his treatment of Cordelia was unjust, and he has a reflection on his mental state. First, Lear insults Goneril and uses a, met a metaphor calling her a detested kite. A kite is a bird that preys on carcasses, much like vultures. Goneril's person and her actions are compared to those of a kite, picking on the remains uh, um, uh, too, too weak to attack when the animals are strong, uh, kites, uh, kites take their turn when the animals are weak or are dead. In the same way, Goneril only shows her true self when Lear loses all of his power and can no longer control her. He then follows by cursing Goneril, hoping she never has a child and that if, she, uh, if he has one, it be a bad one. By doing so, he admits that he no longer has any power, as in order to punish Goneril, he has to appeal to the gods, a higher power than himself, despite the fact that he is still technically king. Uh, at lines 266 and 267, see, Dear Goddess, suspend thy purpose of thou intent to make this creature fruitful. Uh, the process by which he describes giving birth is also compared to nature. The diction of his cursing is very nature-oriented. Thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful, draw her organs of increase, and from her delicate body never spring a babe. These terms, fruitful, dry up, and spring, could just as well apply to a forest or a tree than the <coughs> process of birth. He then vents his emotions by wishing that if Goneril was ever to have a child, it'd be one that is opposite of how a natural child should be. A, a normal child can be turbulent, but he wishes that should Goneril have one, it'd be so perverse, so turbulent, and so unnatural that it's, it leads to her being frustrated constantly to uh, that she is always in tears and to the ruination of her health. Let it, stamp, uh, let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth with cadent tears fret channels in her cheeks. A child is supposed to be the pride of their parent. It is supposed to be a source of happiness and the result of hard work. He wishes that if Ganul has a child, it be the opposite and transforms all her hard work into nothingness so that Goneril and her child be regarded with laughter and antipathy. Turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt. Lines 276 to 277. In fact, he wishes that Goneril experiences uh, how hurtful it is to have an ungrateful children. He compares this betrayal to a serpent's uh, sting. A serpent, of course, carries a symbolism of evil and betrayal. Lear's uh, description of the child is very much exactly how he feels about Goneril. The child is the metaphor for Goneril herself and how she makes Lear feel, and he hopes that she has a taste of her own medicine. Uh, also, nature plays a large role in this response. Uh, there is reference to how 
natural children should behave. Lear and Gloucester both turn to nature when their children betray them. The process of birth is compared to nature and different animals and their symbolisms are also used, such as vultures and snakes. I would suggest that you change yeah. contribute because you guys have uh, you know, a lot of fun on it. So. Yeah, so Lear also okay. expresses his regrets at this at his treatment of Cordelia and defends his men. Lear actually personifies the concept of faults to show how it how it how it affected them. On line two fifty seven and two fifty eight, he says, "Oh, small fault, how ugly, how ugly this thou in Cordelia show." He admits that Cordelia's fault is not small compared to what Goneril has done, or well, to Goneril's behavior actually. And he is also aware of how how uh, well how he said the fault has affected his mental state. And he actually described how fault has damaged his health, which was uh, the frame of nature, and how its existence has sucked like all of the love from his heart. Um, and contributed to the sickness uh, of his spirit, which is, was the gall in this text, and uh, at the moment that he banished Cordelia. He is also aware that his mental state is unsound, and that his, he is slowly sinking into madness. Uh, actually, he blamed it on the fault of his, on the, on, uh, of his children. On line...
So the Earl is disguised as Caius, a man without any social status. While as Caius, he doesn't fall to the very bottom of the social ladder like Edgar will, he still suffers some humiliations that a man of his status shouldn't. So he says on line 163 to 164, I'll wary and overwatch, take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. In the first part of this passage, the hyperbole, all wary and overwatch, shows how hard Ken has been working until now. He is so exhausted that he can even sleep while standing and while being tortured. The second part of this passage shows that he cannot bear to see himself being treated so poorly. The word behold, addiction, shows us how Kent thinks. It is unthinkable for him to believe that he is being put in the broken stock. However, he still has a bit of hope that he can return as himself one day, that he could be in the kingdom as Kent. And that is shown in lines 158 and 159, where he, before reading Cordelia's letter, he says, nothing almost sees miracles, but mystery. This antithesis highlights the fact that Kent is aware of his dire situation, but he still believes that a change can occur, that a miracle can happen. And the last lines of his monologue that says, fortune, good night, smile, once more, turn, tight wheel, on line 165 to 166. He believes that the tables can still be turned and that the wrongs can still be right. This can be seen as a foreshadowing. So Edgar sought to death, decided to disguise himself as Tom O'Bedlam. So he lived with the bare minimum, which is a blanket to cover himself. This could be seen um, by the lines 174 to 177. So Edgar says, My face are grim with filth, blanket my lungs, elf all my hair with knots, and with presented nakedness, out face the wind and persecution of the sky. So here he used enumeration and imagery. So by stripping off his clothes and going out naked, um, he falls to the bottom of the social ladder. So he handles this humility role uh, seriously and act and uh, speak like uh, something even worse than a commoner, like a madman. So Edgar Hopeless says the lines uh, 184 to 186, sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers, enforce their charity, poor to be good, poor Tom, that's something yet Edgar I nothing am. So here, Ed, in the first part, uh, Edgar describes his character of Tom as someone insane. So he used the antithesis between lunatic bands and prayers. So this antithesis uh, means that um, sometimes he would be invoking profanity, but at the same time he would say prayers of one after another. So this eccentric character of Tom um, says the meaningless word to the God. So this shows how eccentric he will act by saying, by saying nothing less. Um, so, Tom is the complete opposite of Edgar, which is a good disguise because nobody will recognize him as, because the two characters are very opposite. One is uh, kind of smart, intelligent, and respectful, and the other one is saying meaningless. On the last part, uh, Edgar is desperate, and this could be seen by the fact, Edgar, I, nothing, am. Um. So, by naming him himself and using the pronoun I, he emphasized on um, the fact that he thinks that he will die as a beggar and not recover his noble uh, status that he once had. Uh, and the second part, um, uh, my bad. secondly, uh, the use of costume uh, is the use of costume to survive is um, present with Kent and Edgar, but uh, they had also differences. Okay, so Kent, he was exiled by the king, but the reason for his return is because he wants to help the king, he wants to help the man who banished him, because he's still loyal to him, which loyalty is obviously an important thing. 
So then the Earl is going through all this trouble, not for himself, but for someone else, to stay by their side and to protect him. We already know of this fight prior to scene seven, but this part of his monologue served to remind us of it and also to contrast with Edward's motive that every we kind of learn um, in scene seven. So on lines 159 to 163, he says, I know this from Cordelia, who has now informed, who has now fortunately, sorry, been informed of my obscure curse and shall find time for this enormous state seeking to give the lost sister remedies. So here I'm going to recall that by helping Lear, he's trying to put order in the kingdom once again. He's trying to repair the damage that Lear has done to the kingdom when Lear decided to divide the kingdom. So Edgar denied and rejected by Gloucester due to Edmund's malicious actions, uh, were a disguise. Not uh, only is he sought to death, but he also let go of his noble status and all of his belongings. Um, by removing his clothes and begging for food, he can easily pass for a beggar. This could be shown by the line 178, where Edgar says, the country gives me proof and precedence. Um, also, uh, he can learn the situation of the kingdom without being caught. So the fact that he can uh, stay low is shown by the lines 169 and 170. That guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. So uh, he's doing all these actions for himself. He doesn't intend to help someone as, as um, Kent does, but rather to preserve his own body. To conclude, Kent and Edgar are both in a miserable situation. The first uh, disguises himself as a poor man and is put in the stocks, whereas the other one um, chooses the character of a bad man and um, let go of his old social status. Both of them are hiding in the kingdom, and, but to stay and take on a, an important role, Kent uh, wants to serve his master and Edgar wants to help himself. Uh, the themes of loyalty, punishment, and social classes are explored, and those themes are universal and uh, still relevant today. Our excerpt happens in scene 11, after which daughter Brigham and Goneril have started against him. It is approximately placed at the half of the play and can be considered as the climax, where the tension hits in highest point. So uh, Lear enters in a shelter where he sees Tom, and there, um, just like the storm was a mirror to Lear's internal conflict, we see that Tom is a mirror to um, actual another side of madness and what Lear's can become. We will demonstrate how Lear's clarity and understanding of the world and his his distress and his own humanity increase at the same time as his madness. Also, in that scene, um, Kent and Edgar are still disguised, adding to the theme of blindness, identity, and lies present in the play. We explored our aforementioned theme, others in our exam, and, ex and highlight them in the rest of the play as well. So, in our uh, exam, um, we see that uh, Liu has a better understanding of his situation and is more and more aware of his own money. Uh, we can see that when he described Tom, to whom he started to identify and find affinity with. He described him in line 96 as a poor, bare, fucked animal. The use of imagery and immersion there shows um, that Lear is slowly losing his pride and realize how fragile and human he is. And that reveals the theme of fragility that we see furthermore with, um, through Lear's and Gloucester perspective as they perceive that they have lost everything rapidly and in a blink. There is also the theme of humanity that um, hits its highest representation at the end of the play when all the characters, whether they are cruel or righteous, die, showing that they are only human. Even more links between Lewis and Tom is done by mirroring their madness with each other. And that shows how insight can be gained through madness. So here we, um, 
the first thing that Ed Tom said to um, Liu is go to Thai, to Thai cold bed and warm tea in line 40, 41. So there the use of antithesis um, opposed um, to um, things, a place that is supposed to be warm and give um, and your affection is actually cold, and that um, the girl, Liu's relationship with his daughter. So Liu was supposed to be um, shelter and taking care of um, with his daughter, but it was actually they were actually cold and really fake in their love for him, and that um, exploded illusion of, and that adds to the illusion of the relationship. Also, an antithesis, antithesis in itself is something that doesn't make sense at first glance, but when we um, we do closer, we have a better understanding of it. Just like Tom who appear as someone who is mad, actually have a lot of insight and understand things even better than you himself. So here we see the theme of madness that um, is involved with Lear and Tom toward all the play, and the theme of illusion and lie that we see with Gonorill, Regan, and Edmund who lie and deceive everyone. Um, that theme of lies and illusion takes an even deeper meaning when um, the one of futility is further developed. And that is done um, when Tom describes his old life, even if it was fake. So um, he said that he was a hog in slot, fox in greediness, dog in madness, lie in prey in life, 83 and 84. And that, and that use of metaphor <coughs> shows how excessive and futile his life was. And even um, present all the flaws that cause his demise. So here, it, um, the use of the metaphor is even is more powerful because um, it really applies to Liu. It is a striking representation of him and the cause of the situation that he is presently in, and exposed furthermore how ins how much insight Tom has. So here we see the theme of futility again that um, we see a lot in the play when the character blames their misfortune on on fate. That is even more shown when Gloucester tried to commit suicide and when he was saved, he still believed it was the God's doing. And also the comparison with animal present uh, another theme that is really important in the play and is the theme of animality that can show the character double nature. So indeed, through this theme we show the theme, uh, we see the theme of animals and the animality. The use of metaphorical comparison with animals and the references to animals comes back in this excerpt and in the play to illustrate what's being said, uh, as well as the character's feelings. For example, when they compare Sconerol to a serpent, it highlights the theme of the character's double nature, as Sheila said. Um, in our excerpt, line 68, he calls Regan and Goneril pelican daughters. Um, here we have an allusion to a fable uh, which states that young pelicans feed on their parents' blood, um, as it says in the footnote. This is a really strong image and it reveals um, to the reader really important themes. Uh, Lear, who is going mad, expresses his rage against his daughters who manipulated him um, to have his kingdom and his power just like the young pelicans uses their parents to have blood and get food. But besides this hidden meaning, he's still comparing them to birds, which aren't the most gracious, uh, which shows how much he despises them. The theme of family relationship destruction and anger are both present uh, through these two words. His figurative blindness is also going away, and facing the truth uh, is what is making him mad um, in this scene. Uh, this reaction could be analyzed anthropologically as just the human nature not wanting to face the reality of things sometimes. Revealed through his madness, we can also see uh, insight. He finally understands who did him wrong and who did him right, so um, Regan uh, and Goneril versus Cordelia. And the theme of uh, animals is also very linked to symbolism. Um, other animals are stated in Edgar's lines when he's describing his fake old life, as Sheila said, with the enumeration of animal cooperation with the hog, the fox, the wolf, and the lion. Here, um, they are symbolized actually the deadly sins, such as the, like laziness, greed, gluttony. And through those animals, the court and its excessive way of doing uh, things and their values all pointed out. Um, um, just like through the animals and what he symbolizes. Further, like later on, um, in line 91 to 98, Lear illustrates these previous accusations when it comes to the court uh, by talking about the physical appearance uh, of Edgar, uh, which shows uh, superficiality. He observes him and judges how he's dressed, and then associates um, animals with uh, how you're supposed to be dressed. So he does also like an enumeration of the worm, the beast, the sheep, the cat. Uh, that is linked with silk, leather, 
uh, wool and perfume, and th these animals symbolize uh, symbolize like the house, like the high society, and uh, it reminds the reader of the king's place in society and how his life used to be and affects still his opinions and prejudices. So here he has a certain insights of on the lives of those who are less privileged than him, which also reminds us of the theme of social classes, as here we have the two extremes of society, the beggar and the king, almost at the same state of madness and despair, like just like, even like physically. Uh, these metaphors, when analyzed and understood, add to the depth and the meaning, and the meaning of the lines. Uh, furthermore, the use of rhetorical questions and a change of perspective shows the confusions in which the characters are. Uh, in the line, um, in the lines 56 to 57, when he says, What has his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldn't thou say not, save nothing? Lear actually go, goes from a third point, like a third perspective, like a third point of view, talking about himself, um, the he, to a second perspective, talking like talking to himself, saying you, like uh, asking questions to himself in the same line, which shows clearly how he's confused and his internal uh, reflection, questioning his existence, his situation, his choices, his bad luck, how he ended up here. Um, he has a hard time understanding how and why things happen, which is linked to the theme of confusion and identity. Um, okay. We also see... That's, that's eight minutes. That's eight and a half okay. minutes. So next. So, um, scene 17 links back to scene 8, when Kent entrusts the first element with a purse containing a ring, which is to be delivered to Cordelia so that she can identify Kent as, as himself, since he is disguised as Caius. Our scene allows the reader to assume that the, the purse also contains a letter with sensitive information about Lear's current state of madness and distress, but also about information, uh, without, also with information about Goneril and Regan's plotting against the king. So the scene uh, is right before Cordelia sees her father with the doctor, and we can see the importance of public image through the retelling of Cordelia's reaction to Kent's letter through characterization and diction. So first and foremost, in order to understand the, um, Cordelia's reaction to the letter, we need to develop on prior events and elements which are directly mentioned in this scene. So the first one is the scene of conflict. Um, the scene of conflict is primarily present in the bigger picture of the scene, since it happens at a time when uh, the French army invades Britain and the British army must prepare for defense. And we see this in the play after an abrupt change of conversation between Kent and the gentleman. So at line 49, uh, Kent asked the gentleman, of Albany's and Cornwall's powers you heard not. So we see that Albany and Cornwall need to prepare for this battle. Uh, the external conflicts uh, are added to internal conflicts, so conflicts between and within the characters. So the two main conflicts concerning King Lear are his conflicts between him and his daughters, so between him and Goneril and Regan, or him and Cordelia. And the second type of conflict is a conflict between Lear and his faults. So this is the conflict that is seen in uh, this scene, since Lear is starting to realize the faults that he committed at the beginning of the play. So that is to say, um, dividing his kingdom between Goneril and Regan, and uh, banishing from Cordelia and disowning her. Uh, we see this because Lear starts to realize that at line 43, 45, that his own unkindness that stripped her from his benediction turned her to foreign casualties. So he realizes that this was extremely cruel and impulsive of him, and he is now starting to feel ashamed for it. Also, the idea of shame is enhanced by Kent saying that uh, a sovereign shame so elbows him at line 43. Uh, so by using the word sovereign, Kent states that mere shame is overwhelming and that it is because of this that he does not want to see Cordelia at that time. So another very important element of this extract is the double nature of women and is illustrated between the opposition, uh, with the opposition between Cordelia and her two sisters, Goneril and Regan. So in the play they are detestable and uh, they here are compared to animals as uh, a lot of times in the play. So they are dark-hearted daughters who sting venomously at lines 46, 47. So they are dehumanized, they are cruel, and they're the ones who contribute to the madness of their father and the rift um, between his relationship with Cordelia, and they act as a poison because they sting venomously. So this animality is pejorative and it is adverse to the goodness that Cordelia embodies. At lines 18 to 20, the first gentleman um, 
uh, recalls uh, Cordelia's expression, and he tells Kent, you have seen sunshine and rain at once, her smiles and tears were 